Hello, my name is Dr. Scott Young with Hearing Solution Centers at HearTulsa.com, and today we're going to talk about the history of hearing aids. Coming right up. Okay, I, I, this is going to be not a huge history lesson, but just a partial history lesson. One of the things that happens with hearing is that we misunderstand huge portions of what really occurs. You see, in the past, there is a, there is a sign, and it's used by in ASL, deaf and dumb. Dumb means that you can't speak, but we've actually morphed that. We had in, in language, when we look at that what, that, what that word means is that they're stupid. And many of the people who had hearing impairments, severe to profound hearing impairment, they'd never heard, so they weren't able to represent speech. And it sounded like they were dumb. So we would put them in psych hospitals with the mentally retarded. And this is a really a sad history that we don't really understand that, that, that comes along with that. Now, I know that many in the ASL community love to use this. I always use ears closed. It's a, a signing exact English kind of conversation, but it, it, it's more effective in that way, okay? Anyway, that's just a little bit of a history point. <clears throat> now, when we look back at history, I actually have a couple things right here. This is just like a, this is a, a different type of horn, but people used to use horns to be able to put the sound into their ears. So they would have an ear horn or something like that. Now what it would do is it would boost up about maybe 15 to 20 decibels, a very small amount, but boost up in a few of the speech frequencies <coughs> and help them a little bit. But any person who had that, um, you know, that type of ear horn, and there, there's actually ones that were attached to the throne of a king, and that king would, you know, st people were still screaming at him to have that communication. Now, there are lots and lots of illnesses that could be caused. <coughs> Bad, um, uh, you know, I don't even know. There's so many different illnesses. I could, I could go on and on about, about which one. I don't want to get into the specifics of them. But they could have been caused at that time frame that would have caused the hearing loss. And again, without knowing exactly what those illnesses were and what caused that kind of hearing loss, whether it was a high fever or whatever, we won't know exactly how, how to treat that. So they really didn't have a lot of medical understanding in there. Now, we're going to show you on the screen, I'm going to put some different ones out there that will give you an idea of some of the history of the hearing aids that are out there. At first, we had body-worn devices. I wish I could pull this one movie, but YouTube would have a hissy fit about this issue. But, but basically, there was this movie in the 80s, <clears throat> actually probably in the 90s, and the police officer walks up to the front door, he knocks on the door, and the person comes up and he has a body-worn device and that was hooked up to a big wire kind of thing, and that's how he heard. And yet, in the 90s, we were already using completely in the canal devices, and that's how bad Hollywood is in representing that. I'll give you another example. Um, there was a movie, actually, and I really love the series because I'm a singer as well, and Pitch Perfect actually had a, uh, the beginning of the Pitch Perfect movie, um, they have Fat Amy walks up to um, DJ, and she thinks they're DJs, but they're really deaf Jews. And, and, and what they're wearing is, they're wearing a sort of temporary device they didn't go off, the, the producers didn't spend the money to go get a real hearing aid for the person. They just got some really cruddy device that kind of looked like that. That's the kind of stuff that Hollywood misses when we look at that. And yet, um, body devices were the, the rage. That was all that we had. Now, in the around 50s to 60s, we're going to see a behind-the-ear device right here that you're going to see on the screen. And the behind-the-ear device was something that was over the ear, and then we had an ear mold. Now, it was it, it's <coughs> still somewhat used, sorry about my cough there, somewhat used today, but not very many times do we have to use this type. 
Some people would disagree with me and some people want this and some people have to use it depending upon that circumstance, but we really don't have to use it very many times as much. And it's, it's a big device with that too. Um, but again, it's made for the prescription that we look at. The next one down is called the in the ear. Now Starkey is hearing a manufacturer actually is the first one that actually pushed out an ear in the ear device. Bill Austin was looking at this and saying, why can't we make a custom piece that put it all together? But as you have the microphone and the speaker very close to one another, it would reduce the amount of amplification that you could do without whistle. Now, if you've ever been, had a microphone in a church or in a lecture, and you get too close to the speaker, they'll start whistling, and then they have to move away, have to adjust the volumes, all this kind of stuff happens. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> but they have that same problem in hearing it. And so that's why it took a little bit better technologies, a little better shielding, and all kinds of other stuff to fix the ability to wear that. Now, then they started pushing on in the canal type of hearing aids, okay? And we just might easily call it <laughs> <clears throat> excuse me, a canal-based hearing aid. Now, Ronald Reagan, most people don't realize that the president in the, uh, in the 80s, so he was from 80 to 88, was the first person, and it was in the middle of his first term, that he started to wear an in-the-ear hearing aid. I mean, in the canal hearing aid. And it was, it was revolutionary. I mean, it actually messed with our whole industry. Now, Starkey couldn't say that they fit it. Now, years later, they would say it basically when he was dead, and they were the first ones that kind of pushed that. You see, Starkey's pushing the envelope of smaller and smaller. Now, then they came up with the, <coughs> excuse me, in the canal hearing aid. Now, I was, I started in this industry, you know, I started in grad school in 89, I finished in 91, and uh, in the, I mean, completely in the canal type of hearing aids, what they were is a really kind of cool hearing aid. Now, um, there was a lot of misunderstanding going on. I remember in 95, I was in Dallas at American Academy of Audiology convention. And at the time, because of the place that I was working at, we would do maybe two to 400 hearing aids a month. People don't realize that, I mean, it could happen. And um, you know, I was, I'd fit more than every single person on the stage. And I kind of noticed they were, I'd fit 25, I fit 42, I fit 35, and you know, and I've, I fit more than all of them put together. Um, I'd overseen more than about four or five times the number and what they were talking about is you know half of the conversations that were happening in the, in the early middle 90s were completely wrong about the complete the canal hearing it. It was a great hearing it. We used it a lot, but we had to learn some of the different ways by experience. And it's a great hearing it. Now, then we moved into the receiver in the canal. And again, I'm going to show you without doing that on the screen. You can kind of see that right here. Okay? A, a receiver in the canal. Now, different companies call it different ways, but it's made for a person to ha that is, has a mild to moderate, maybe up to a severe hearing loss. Now, we can do the more powerful ones by putting a power speaker on the end of that wire. And now I can actually fit it on so many. When I first started my practice in 2005, well, really 2006, um, what happened is that we didn't have that capability. And then around 2008, we started utilizing these power speakers inside of a receiver in the canal. It was a really cool feature because we could push the power abilities and fit many more people. So that kind of gives you a little bit about what's happened over the years. And by the way, the technology changes all the time. I mean, they're always coming up with something new and we're trying to figure out how we slot that into the capabilities. And, and, and some of it is by experience that we have to look at that. A manufacturer might tell me some great information, but I might find out <coughs> by reality, mm, it doesn't exactly work that way. Um, and we might find issues that we have to look at. And now, now we're having to you know, plug them into our iPhones and, 
and to, you know, so an Android type of phone as well, and they're streaming through it. And then there's a whole new set of problems that kind of come up. And it was funny because, you know, one of the uh, cell phone manufacturers, I won't get into exactly who, um, just emailed me just today. We're in February of 2021. And they're emailing me and they were talking about, you know, giving me some better support. And I'm like, your support has really sucked. I'm sorry. But your support was sucked because I need to have patients who have some more support when there's really something wrong with the phone. And so it becomes a deeper intimation that we have to go with, with the hearing aid technology, because here's where we've come to. And so as we finish this up, here's what we've come to. Hearing aid technology have firmware inside of it. These are app-based hearing aids, which the apps are updated by the hearing aid manufacturer. So the hearing aid manufacturer is actually updating these, sending an, <coughs> excuse me, an update to the app, and then the phones have their own firmware update, which they're driving that. And so we're talking about um, even more complicated than the technology going on in computers. You see, if you have Windows, 10 and then they have a version of 1.1, 1 1.8, 1, 1. you know, whatever, right? You get the idea. Um, and they go into newer versions. They're looking at how the interaction of the programs happen. But that's all you have to overall worry about. Now, you do have to worry about RAM and other kind of issues in there. But we have three separate levels that could have difficulties. And so that is something that audiologists have to do. And that's why the over-the-counter hearing aids are never, ever gonna work, because they're never gonna be able to um, integrate all of the points of technology. And you need to have the audiologist to help you. So I thank you for listening. Leave some comments down below. We will talk much more about a lot of other cool things. Thank you so much.